May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning. A special shout out to those who've been studying the prophets. I'm preaching on Isaiah. So here we go. Isaiah said this, or God borrowing Isaiah's heart and mouth said this. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of those who are afflicted, then your light shall rise, your light shall rise in the darkness. Now it's important to understand that the most frequently quoted scripture by Jesus Christ was Isaiah. So isn't it interesting that Jesus, the prophet Jesus, tells us to let our light shine. He's being consistent with the prophetic tradition. His name was Mr. Jones, and I had waited for Mr. Jones. You see, Mr. Jones had just been hired as an assistant press professor of English at my college, and I had been waiting for somebody like Mr. Jones because his predecessor required a 30-page paper for the required course in world literature, and I waited him out. <laughs> and finally, Mr. Jones arrived. But unfortunately, now with my sort of pastoral intuition and what I've read and what I've known, I believe Mr. Jones, unfortunately, was bipolar. He wore the same trench coat to every class. <laughs> he was disorganized, disheveled. It, he was wasting away before our very eyes. Some of us actually took him to dinner. We were so worried about him. But on an eventful day, and the only thing I remember from that class, the one thing I remember is he taught me about something called a uh, Homeric epithet, which is like something like ox-eyed Hera. So I was just beginning to notice Barbara, and she was in the same class, and I wrote her a Homeric epithet uh, <laughs> to capture her attention or to attempt to do so. It wasn't all wasted. But I will never forget the day when Mr. Jones looked me in the eye and in front of the entire class said the following, Mr. Gulick, why are you so contemptuously bored? <laughs> I freely admitted to myself that I was in fact bored but it was the first time, certainly the first time publicly, that I had been accused of contempt. <laughs> I will never forget that moment. I am quite ashamed to admit that he was, as our Brits would say, spot on. <laughs> My struggle with contempt was not and is not limited to a moment in my undergraduate education. God help me. And by the way, something you'll know about me and you should know about most preachers is I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to me in your hearing. Okay? God help me. I struggle with this sin of contempt. I struggle with it constantly. I am guilty of the sin that Isaiah rails against in today's reading. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger. I've been pointing the finger a lot. Now, another thing that you will come to learn about me is that I adhere to Karl Barth's advice to preachers. Karl Barth was the theologian 
the greatest theologian probably of the 20th century. His theology was formed in the crucible of Hitler's taking over the Christian church in Germany in the 1930s. That's the crucible that, that informed his theology. And Karl Barth said to every Christian preacher, you must preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That's that prophetic, prophetic preaching. You see, the prophets were not foretellers of the future. They were articulating God's perspective on the now, capital N. The now that you and I are living through, the now of today, the now of today in the United States of America, in the world in 2020. That's the only now we've got and God would like to speak in the now. So, having lived this week, and having prepared to preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper and the television and all that we've seen, I think it's a particular week that people of faith have to reflect upon. What a week. What a week of finger pointing. It's been finger pointing all week long, hasn't it? Contempt apparently was a problem in Isaiah's day. It certainly is in ours. And if you are alive now, and if you are alert now, and I know you are, reading the paper and watching TV, you watched an impeachment trial leading to an acquittal, a senator's testimony, problems around a frightening virus, problems counting votes in Iowa, a lot of finger pointing there, there was a State of the Union address, the awarding of the Medal of Freedom. Everything that happened involved finger pointing. It was a week of finger pointing. And of particular interest to me though, of particular interest to me, was the National Prayer Breakfast. That's religious, right? And we're religious people, so we should be thinking about that. Was the National Prayer Breakfast, which occurred in the very midst of a week of a veritable orgy of finger pointing. One might well say a festival of contempt. That's what I perceive that we've all lived through in this last week. A festival of contempt. And yet, in the very heart of the moment, governmental leaders, Republicans with their Republican chair of the prayer breakfast, and Democrats with their Democratic chair of the prayer breakfast, paused to honor the tradition of setting aside all differences to stand in solidarity and pray for the good of the country they are so privileged to serve. And so I say, God bless Arthur C. Brooks. Why would I say that? Arthur C. Brooks was the person invited to speak at this week's prayer breakfast. He was, until recently, the director of the American Enterprise Institute, a very interesting right-of-center think tank. He's now professor at Harvard. He's a columnist for the Washington Post. And most importantly, he's an intentional Jesus-believing Christian whose latest book, which is not about politics or economics, his expertise, but about his faith, and it has the title, think of this, Love Your Enemies. That's his latest book. And there he was, seated within inches of the Avenger and the Ripper passionately 
reflecting on the Lord Jesus and his admonition, admonition to forgive. I cannot imagine it. I preached in a lot of contexts. I've never preached in that context. I cannot imagine it. I read his entire address. I found it powerful. I found it profound. And I found it personally confronting and converting. And you're going to get a lot of it. <laughs> Quoting the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, he said, he defined contempt. Listen to this definition. This is not Gulick. This has nothing to do with me. This is some other brilliant person. Contempt is the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of the other. I think that bears repeating. It might even bear taking notes. I'm saying it for someone else's quote, by the way. Contempt is the unsullied conviction of the worthlessness of the other. He quoted that with Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump within a few feet of him. Maybe he should get the Profiles and Courage Award. <laughs> As a pastor, I was just stunned that he went on to quote John Gottman, a noted marriage counselor, who claims that he can predict with a 94% success rate whether a couple will be divorced within three years. And he can predict that based on a one-hour counseling session. And he's tracked his predictions, and he has a 94% rate. What he looks for is what he calls the contempt habit. The contempt habit. Indications of the contempt habit, and those of you who happen to be married, or happen to be parents, or happen to be in a human relationship, or have a friend, or work on a staff, or live in community of some kind, it might be wise, here again I'm not quoting Gulick, I'm quoting him to pay attention to the characteristics of a contempt habit. The characteristics are sarcasm, sneering, hostile humor, anger masquerading as humor, and frequent eye rolling. For 94% of marriages, these behaviors result in the death of the bond. Brooks continued by making three suggestions. These are really good. They would be the best Lenten discipline I could imagine. Here are his three suggestions. Ask God to give you the strength to reject contempt. Number one, ask God to give you the strength to reject contempt. Second, make a commitment to another person to reject contempt. In other words, get a partner in this enterprise of contempt rejection. And third, look for contempt and answer it with love. Look for contempt and answer it with love. He gave an example of his last suggestion out of his own recent experience addressing a conservative gathering. He has the bona fides for it. And he said he, when he got there, he decided that he would change his topic as he listened to the other speeches. So his, he talked, he said, my topic today is forgiveness. And then he went on to talk about the great American tradition. And any of you that have seen Hamilton know this. The great American tradition since the beginning 
of dialogue over conflicting ideas held sincerely by different folks with different perspectives. That's how we got born. A dialogue over conflicting ideas by different people with different perspectives. Hamilton and Jefferson profoundly disagreed. But in the working of those disagreements, something good got born. It's called the Constitution. And in the middle of his talk, a woman interrupted him. She just stopped him and said, but the liberals are evil. In response, he said, told his own story. He's funny. He said, I was raised by a college professor and an artist who live in Seattle, Washington. I couldn't have been raised by more liberal people in the most liberal city in the United States, and I am a profound disappointment to them in so many ways. <laughs> but he goes on to say, they taught me the most important thing that I believe. The only important thing I believe, that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. He said to that meeting, they are not evil. Google the talk, please. Don't take my word for it. It is worth reading every word, particularly when you remember the context and who was right behind him as he was speaking. <coughs> As I was reading it and remembering this week's news, I remembered Jesus preaching his first sermon at the synagogue in Nazareth. When after quoting Isaiah again, here again, those of you studying the prophets, be alert. His sermon <laughs> wasn't tremendously successful. The response was to try to throw him off the cliff. Mr. Mr. Brooks' audience, upon hearing this, or at least one person, upon hearing this Christ-central message said, Arthur, I don't know if I agree with you. However, sadly, sadly, if you were to take a look at the totality of my life, I'm not talking about your life. I can't confess your shortcomings or your growth edges. I can only confess mine. If you look, if somebody took a movie of my life, or what's even scarier, if someone took a movie of the inner life of some Christian churches I've had to deal with, some churches even feel that contempt is their dearest possession. Barbara and I were having dinner at our new part-time home at Ashby Ponds. We happened to be at a table with an Episcopalian who, as she licked the olive from her second martini, <laughs> told me how much she hated her former rector. And she wasn't a bit embarrassed to tell me that. Her contempt was her dearest possession. She nurtured it. She caressed it. And I thought, first of all, I've got to know her because <laughs> she needs pastoral care. But I'm that way too. There are certain prized, exquisitely important resentments that if I am honest, I have been cherishing, even cultivating. And sometimes those release, uh, res resentments, sometimes those resentments are absolutely delicious. Like the apple that Adam and Eve shared. Sometimes contempt is that poison we drink hoping someone else will die. And yet, 
channeling Miss Benny Hamilton of this church, my art history teacher when I was eight. I'm going to show you a piece of art that I actually traveled to see, to see the actual painting. This is the Eisenheim altarpiece. It was painted in the 1500s by Grunwald. It hung as the chapel altarpiece in a hospice where monks were taking care of per persons dying of a dreaded disease called St. Anthony's Fire. It was a disease that peasants got from eating barley bread with a certain fungus. And it caused terrible pain, a horrid death, and awful sores that appeared on the skin. If you can look close, and I'm going to leave this on the pew for you to look at. If we were in a big mega church, I would have it projected now. <laughs> but I'm going to leave it on the pew for you to look at, and you will notice the sores on our Lord's body. You will also notice a very strange thing. There is this person pointing with an elongated finger to the Christ. And that's John the Baptist. And you would think, well, what in the earth world? He disappeared after Herod cut off his head. What's he doing at the Passion? It's a statement of Grunewald's theology that he has defeated death. So it's perfectly fine for John the Baptist to be there. Pointing, pointing with his finger to the Lamb of God. That's the kind of finger pointing that's okay. In fact, that is the kind of finger pointing that we were called to be about by virtue of our holy baptism. You and I are to live lives, to live lives that enlighten this increasingly dark finger pointing world addicted to contempt. And we must, we must understand that that is our sacred task as well as our sacred trust. We need more Episcopalians and we need more Christians who are as clear, who are as clear as the preacher on the day of national prayer. We need more Christians and more Episcopalians to commit to the Republican Party. We need more Christians and more Episcopalians to commit to the Democratic Party. Knowing that their first loyalty in trying to work for the good of the common order is their loyalty to Jesus Christ, and that transcends everything. That is what we desperately need at this moment in our life. And we dare not, as light, as people trusted to point to the passion, allow any aspect of our allegiances or our perspectives to drift towards the delicious but deadly sin of contempt. If we teeter on contempt, what light do we have to offer in this darkness, in this now in which we find ourselves? Having said that, there's another thing about the now, isn't it? It got to be 65 degrees last week in the midst of all the cacophony in Antarctica. If there was ever anything calling us to one humanity, it is the danger to our planet. And last week, I watched, in a really depressing week, a beautiful sight, gloves and masks and medical supplies sent on a cargo trip from our country to China. If there's one thing that convinces us of our common humanity, it's a disease that threatens us all. And all of those seemingly important differences certainly fade when the coronavirus is nipping at our heels. So, love your enemies. <laughs> 
Even as Arthur Brooks said, you should fake it if you don't feel it. <laughs> because you see, and, and they're great spiritual directors that would say the same thing. You know, we're big on feelings. We think feelings are the most important thing. The truth is we can develop some habits and then the feelings change. So fake it. Fake forgiving your enemies. Practice it. Then our lives might look cruciform. And our gaze can then toward, turn towards the poor and the hungry and the hopeless. And we begin to see. And then God can use our eyes. Amen.